<laughs> okay, so um, embodied ethics kind of arising from this observation that there's a lot of talk about the issues in our world, in our country, in this city. You know, we talked a lot last week about how you can't even walk down the street here without seeing suffering. Uh, and so uh, this practice, or sorry, this, this series of classes has kind of arisen to focus on meditations and conversations um, to help plant these seeds of change. Um, so I'm not proposing that we tear down the system. It's more that we start doing the inner work that's needed. So when it eventually fails, we'll have the resources that we need to step forward and kind of usher in a new way of being that is less destructive and uh, more constructive for not just self, but for all beings. Uh, so um, it's a series of classes uh, that will include meditation, teaching, and conversation. So co-creating and kind of sharing our experiences, our thoughts, our questions um, are really important to kind of making this class come alive. Um, and it's called Embody because it can't just be thinking about ethics. You know, a lot of times we have a very intellectual orientation to ethics. It's it's very heady, very cognitive base. And that's important and that's good, but we also have to feel it. Um, we're gonna talk a lot about that today. Um, so it's embodied in the aspect that there's an invitation here to really feel what's coming up, um, but also to act in a way that is more ethical in the world, that we embody, that we model. Um, I, I like to think that there's this, uh, not just planting seeds, but there's this ripple effect. So when we start practicing and we start reflecting on what it is that um, creates ethical ways of being, that, that that's like a vibrational shift that will start uh, rippling out people around us. We'll feel that, they'll see that. Uh, and so that's really where this class differs from other explorations of ethics that are a little bit more um, intellectual. Uh, my name is Tig, for those of you that I haven't met uh, in the past. Uh, I teach a program called Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction and Cultivating Emotional Balance. They're two secular programs um, that really help establish practice. So they're intensive trainings, um, both on embodied awareness and um, our emotional experience. Welcome to those that are just joining online. Uh, so I am consulting and teaching at the Mayo Clinic, developing a center for mindfulness there. I also am teaching for a research study at Brown University, and I also teach courses at Pratt Institute. It's a design school in New York City. Um, so that's a little bit about my professional background, but really what I feel um, I want to talk a little bit about more with my background, we talked a little bit about it last week, was just this uh, waking up that I had in about 2012 and just feeling very dissatisfied with uh, the world that I kind of woke up in. I was working in um, corporate marketing as a creative director, and it always felt like something was a little bit off, but wasn't really quite sure what it was. And as I started deepening my own practices and paying attention and um, some of the things that we're going to be exploring tonight, I was just really deeply troubled by what was happening, what was I was seeing inside the corporate hierarchy, the effect that it's having on the, um, the people that are working there, the workforce, also the consumer, kind of like the psychological manipulation of what it takes to operate a business in a capitalist culture, um, and, uh, and the damage that it's doing to the planet. Um, and I tried, you know, tried to work with it, tried to, you know, work from within the system and ended up burning myself out and just continued to feel this overriding sense of dissatisfaction, um, which eventually led me to leave that and kind of dedicate my, my life full time to teaching meditation and creating art. Um, <laughs> So uh, tonight is, or this series of classes is kind of uh, embodiment of all the things that I've been experimenting. We talked a little bit last week about this, uh, this word experimenting. I don't have it perfect. No one really has this perfect. Uh, it's just bringing this awareness to what these issues are, 
and then experimenting. What are other ways that we can be in the world? So for me, I've been playing with uh, resource-based sharing through uh, gifting economy. Um, I kind of renounced my own belongings and have been um, for eight years living nomadically as a way of kind of exploring different ways of being. Um, and they've had uh, certain degrees of success and pleasant aspects. And also it's been kind of hard, you know, going against the stream, um, trying to uh, live in a different way than the world is set up. Um, but uh, at the end of the day, I do feel a sense of satisfaction that at least I'm trying. And I see, you know, I think that that resonates a lot of nodding heads there. So uh, thank you for showing up because I think that that can also be an experiment for you um, of what some of these things that we're talking about tonight can mean and how you can bring them to life in your own embodied way. Um, so we'll have some time to introduce ourselves. It's a smaller group tonight, so we've got plenty of time to talk and say hi. Um, but before we do that, I'd like to invite us into just uh, settling in and opening practice. So um, maybe about 10 minutes of meditation. Um, so finding a, a way of being for the next 10 or so minutes that feels supportive for you, whether it's remaining seated or perhaps laying down or standing up. If you're in the space, there's cushions and blankets. <clears throat> starting to invite this transition from the outer world, a world of goals and striving to our inner world, a place that can be more easeful based on intention. So maybe closing the eyes or perhaps just softening the gaze and lowering down to the floor. Let's take a moment just to notice what's here. What energy are you bringing into our session tonight? Perhaps you're noticing an energy in the mind, maybe lingering energy from conversations or things that happened today. Perhaps noticing a sense of anticipation for this class or a to-do list of all the things that need to happen after. What kind of mood are you in? And whatever it is that you're finding here is welcome. There's no way that you should or shouldn't be right now. Just taking this Precious time to check in, take this internal weather report of systems passing through. Taking a moment to notice the energy that's in the body. So perhaps a sense of sleepiness or being tired. Maybe there's a more energetic feel in the body. So much of this series of classes is based on awareness and noticing. So here we are just practicing that already by checking in, seeing what's here, how we're responding to it. And let's start to focus in on sensations in the body, perhaps inviting the awareness to wherever you're feeling the contact of the chair or floor or cushion. So much of cultivating a sense of embodied ethics is being with the felt experience of the body. 
So just taking a moment to feel that support, that contact rising up to hold the body. And as we're here resting with our awareness on the ground, you can also broaden our attention to call to mind that we're here as a community, both online and in person. So feeling that support, what it's like to be sharing space tonight together. And even though we may be separated by many, many miles, we're all here resting on this same ground. Broadening the awareness now to include those that came before us on this ground that we're on. Including the indigenous people of the lands that you're on right now. Recognizing, honoring these indigenous tribes in San Francisco, the land of the Olani people. calling to mind their joys, their sorrows. And then with an awareness of this ground, this community, those that have come before, start to invite a sense of ease into the body. Noticing if there's any obvious areas of tension or tightness and just see what happens when you bring your awareness to those areas of the body. Perhaps they soften and release. Maybe not. Maybe just allowing any tension that's still lingering. And inviting a sense of ease through the muscles of the face, softening the jaw, relaxing the shoulders, all the way down into the abdomen, the pelvic floor, just inviting this sense of ease, softening. The optimal place for us to grow and learn and do this type of work is in a relaxed nervous system, grounded body, attentive mind, and the sense of ease. Perhaps you'd like to linger here, feeling that steadiness of the ground, or perhaps continuing to soften into the body, or perhaps joining me and just taking a few deep breaths, breathing in and feeling that air as it expands through the torso, and every out breath, a chance to experience a letting go, a softening, a relaxation. And if you're with me with the breath, just continuing to breathe in this way, perhaps elongating the inhale, slowing down the exhale. Perhaps on the next in breath, a sense of expansion through the abdomen as if you're filling a balloon with air. And then a sense of softening through the abdomen as you let go and breathe out.
And whether you're with sensations of contact or ease or the breath, just notice how the mind may be moving in this moment, taking you away from the sensory experience that you're paying attention to and know that in this practice, that's never a problem. The wandering mind is simply something to practice with. And we can notice what's happening in the mind stream with a sense of openness and not judgment. When we're ready, choosing to return back to the sensory experience that we've chosen to rest our attention with just for a few more moments. Now releasing the object of your attention and gathering up your awareness now. Before we make a transition out of this practice, let's take a moment just to call to mind something joyful that we're experiencing in this moment or earlier today. Perhaps a moment of gratitude or appreciation, something that went well. And as you call to mind this joyful moment, pay particular attention to what arises in the body. How does that feel? And beyond just labeling it as good or pleasant, see if you can identify a specific sensation in the body that's attributed to this joyful experience that you've had or are having. and keeping part of your awareness anchored in this feeling and an invitation here to just gently turn and look at something that might be difficult in this moment or, or that happened earlier today. Just reading the headline of something that was unpleasant or challenging. Perhaps just staying here with part of the awareness anchored in that pleasant feeling and part of the awareness resting with this difficulty. Or perhaps you'd like to turn towards that challenge a bit more fully. Visualize it happening. And if it feels okay, sensing into where that might be felt in the body. Is there a specific sensation that you can identify that's attributed to this challenge? And what is it like to call to mind both of these dichotomies? Something pleasant, something unpleasant happening now or earlier today? Can we create space for both to be here?
And as we come to an end of this opening practice, let's take a moment just to follow one more breath into the body. And as we exhale, letting go of the air, letting go of that practice, and perhaps inviting some movement into the fingers and toes or moving into some gentle stretches just to help make a transition out of that practice, coming back to open eyes if they were closed. <clears throat> So thank you all for that practice. I'd love to just go around the room and on Zoom and say hi. Um, so an invitation to just say your name if you feel comfortable sharing, if you'd like to offer pronouns, and also maybe sharing the feeling of joy and the feeling of sorrow that you experience today or right now. Um, and just kind of keeping it pithy, sure, just what was the feeling of joy and what was the feeling of sorrow for you today? Do you have the microphone? Okay. You mean where, are you asking where in the body was it? Mm -hmm. And your name. Okay, uh, my name is Daniel. I use he and him pronouns. Um, the feeling of sorrow was, I felt it in my neck. Um, and the feeling of joy was more like just above that, like in the lower part of my head, kind of moving up. Thank you. Hi, my name is Ian. Uh, my feeling of joy is kind of in the chest area. And the feeling of sorrow was lower down. Uh, in the stomach area. Hi, Kim. I feel like I'm, I don't know, on stage or something. <laughs> um, the feeling of joy was in my mouth. It was my taste buds. And the feeling of so uh, sorrow was um, in my heart. Your heart. Mm -hmm. Thanks for sharing. Uh, I'm Faiza. She, her. Uh, I think both joy and sorrow were around my heart because um, existence of some warmth and then losing it, both the joy and the sorrow. Okay. Thank you. And let's move online. So Tia, maybe you could start us off and then call on someone to follow you. Um, my name is Tia. She or they are fine for me. And um, my joy was, um, I, it really felt suffused kind of throughout the body, like a, the, the um, uh, like an exuberance and, and it's kind of encompassing. Um, but the, the challenging part was in my throat for sure, like very focused and I even started coughing. So that was mm. super interesting. Um, Diane, are you up for going next? Hi, I'm Diane. She, her. Thank you, Tia. Um, thankfully, I didn't notice any sorrow today, but definitely um, I've been working on noticing more joy. And it's kind of hard to articulate where it is because I think my nervous system is more like into the what's wrong mode. So I'm trying to switch gears, but it's more like the joy, just like this enthusiasm. So it's more central. Whereas the discursive kind of feelings are more toward my stomach. Thank you for asking. Thank you for sharing. And you would like to call on someone to go next? How about Sarana, if I'm hopefully pronouncing her name properly? Yeah, I'm Sarana. I'm she or they. Um, today, I felt a lot of like fear and sadness. And I think I felt that on my chest. Um, and, but during the day when I meditated, I feel really nice in the park. And I think my crown chakra was very activating and that felt good. Okay. And I will pass it to Julie. Sorry if I'm pronouncing wrong. Fine. Thank you. Um, 
So feeling, I think a lot of it's like right here because I've been on Zoom all day, but then I got to take a walk. So then I was like dancing and moving. And so it felt good. Mm. And um, suggest Eve if you're available. Hi, I'm, I'm unfortunately managing some family health stuff here. Um, so sorry if, if I'm dropping off, there's some, um, yeah, stuff going on. So I'm feeling that, just the kind of elevated um, energy of concern, but also a bigger picture of um, feeling so Thanks, Eve, and let's go to Debbie. Oh, thank you, uh, Debbie. She, her, my, my jo uh, joy was uh, uh, in my upper body. I felt light and and felt felt uh, very good. And my oh. sorrow today was in, in my chest area. Thanks for sharing. And there's one more person. We can't see your name, but it's Darlene. it's. Michael. It's Michael. Michael, are you up for, oh. for for checking in? I'd love to share. So this is Michael Aloni Land, and um, I experienced a lot of joy and you know taste buds danced, lightness mm -hmm. of the body, and I really noticed like the head grows up, the shoulders melt, and there's just total comfort and ease and a sweet lightness euphoria in the inner body and not much sorrow so I'm going to talk about anger um, mm. very hot hot face heavy tense um, very high pitta energy and mm. uh, and then I, I want to burger this and then that was kind of dissipated by hearing people's joys in my Brahma Vihara's group, so deep bows. Mm. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, my my pleasant sensation was all my skin. I took about 10 minutes in the sun this afternoon, just felt that all through my exposed skin. And then my sorrow today was like a, a sinking, like a heaviness in my chest. So thank you all for sharing. It's interesting because there was a lot of head nodding as other people were sharing. So what was that like for y'all to hear other people's felt experience of their joy and their sorrow? What was coming up as you were listening to other people today? Connection. Connection. Yeah. Uh, there's a there's a way that um, the the uh, description of the connection is resonance, um, like that. So that that uh, so there's a like I don't know. I I feel like resonance is I feel like resonance is a feeling. Ha ha. Um, but uh, my experience of resonance is like in my chest and it it's a vibration, right? So the that vibration like inspires the head nod when I feel that, like, oh, this is this is a resonance with that thing. Yeah. Mm. Um, so it's 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 kind of a, a a body one where connection can also describe a lot of intellectual thing or or um or even more distant but connective activities but the 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 thing that i get in these kind of situations feels like resonance mm. yeah that was so well articulated i love that the idea of i mean i love anything with vibration you know like i'm all about the vibe so i love that you kind of went to that place of resonance with a vibration and i think that also further is kind of um, the idea of connection. Yeah. Anything else come forward while you're hearing other people's joys and sorrows?
I felt some curiosity, you know, because the invitation wasn't really so much to talk about why or what the event was, but just kind of where you were feeling it. And so especially with some of the sorrow, I was really like, huh, I wonder what caused that, you know, and I wonder how they're feeling now. Like that, that was kind of some of the things that I was noticing for me. And, and also like there was a lot of this happening, feelings in here, you know, throat, face, chest. So there does seem there does seem to be some commonality with where we're feeling some of it. Yeah. Can you hear me if I don't pick up the mic? Yeah. I don't think so. I appreciate the attempt. <laughs> for for me, it was actually a relief not to have to go into the story. Yeah. 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 Thank you. That first we're going to share. Share why. So I kind of thought about where it was in my body enough, and so just think about feeling like where where it's going for me. Yeah. Others to your point, Mark. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and and more specifically, because you are you're delineating the difference between thinking and feeling, right? And that's really what this offering is based on. Like we have to really feel. We can't think our way through the problems that we're having with ethics. We got to feel it. So I really appreciate that you said that. Thank you. Yeah, a good sort of thing about like our tendency to focus more on the sorrow. Mm -hmm. You know exactly remember how good I am, but. The, the part, or especially when we were focusing on both, it's really interesting. Yeah. Because I really noticed that too, that actually the event that happened that brought me joy, I, I actually completely forgot about it. Mm -hmm. And to call it was really interesting because it, it was a really joyful moment. Mm -hmm. So Daniel was just sharing about like resonating with what Diane was saying of um, the the sorrow the sorrow aspect of it uh, like kind of overtaking uh, and we do have this innate we have this built in negativity bias it's a survival mechanism that we do tend to focus on things that are negative or a potential threat as a survival mechanism um, and that's why it's so important to also hold and make space for what it is that we're grateful for, that we don't lose sight because we can become really fixated on the sorrow and, and start spiraling down into it. Um, so, and then, and you was also just sharing the interest, an interesting feeling about being, being with both of them, which is what our main, we're going to spend some more time practicing with today, kind of being with both of those dichotomies. So thank you all for sharing. Um, before we jump into kind of our topic for tonight, I do want to just kind of help set a little bit of a container here um, with just a couple of quick agreements. Um, just an invitation for all of us to really be here, be present um, with what you're experiencing, be in the body, feel what comes up when you hear things, whether I'm sharing or other people or in our practice. So really setting that intention to be present and and see this entire um, evening as a practice. So both times when we're in a formal practice, times when we're speaking and times when we're listening, they're all part of cultivating a sense of embodied awareness. Um, an invitation to participate, which you all are doing so beautifully well, thank you. Um, but really we're co-creating this space together. Uh, and so as much as it feels comfortable, participating, we'll have hopefully the last 30 minutes of just open conversation. Um, so inviting participation there and also knowing that you don't have to. So you can pass, you don't have to speak up if that's not feeling great tonight. Um, and then taking care of yourself. So if you need to take a break, please do. If you're here uh, in person, there's a restroom and tea in the back. Please feel free to take a break whenever you might need. Um, and <clears throat> Just really listening, you know, as, as I said in that opening practice, we learn and grow best when we're kind of in this optimal zone um, where we feel safe and relaxed. Um, when we start moving into hyper awareness or hypo awareness or activity, it's really difficult to practice and to learn. So just really take care of yourself, listen to what you need, 
um, and then let's take care of each other. Um, so really respecting different viewpoints, our strength comes from our diversity. So really um, sharing your truth um, and respecting each other's and also avoiding giving advice. Uh, so sometimes people might share and you might want to um, share something that helped you along your journey. Um, and that's very much appreciated, but doing so from the I perspective rather than the you. Um, we believe here at the Dharma Center that all beings are innately whole and perfect and don't need to be fixed. Uh, so trusting the innate wisdom and compassion that's inside of uh, yourself and each other um, and an opportunity for deep listening. So when other people are sharing, you can use that as a practice of just listening to what they're sharing. Um, there's a, a longer setup uh, on, on YouTube from our, our class last week, which was kind of the introductory class. So um, where we talk a little bit more um, about secular ethics, uh, but and I'll kind of touch into a little bit of it before we get into our topic. Um, but also just wanted to name, um, since I am holding the space, my own uh, unconscious bias that I might be carrying into the room. I am embodied in uh, male form and I do have white skin. And so my privilege has afforded me the opportunity to study, learn, practice, be here and present these teachings. But also my lived experience is different from everyone else in this room. And so I strive to teach in a universal way and offer practices and reflections that will resonate, resonance. Um, and sometimes that might not feel aligned with what your lived experience is. And so I really invite you to share if that's coming up um, and we can grow and learn together. So last week we talked a little bit about um, secular ethics and this, this idea of embodiment. So ethics, the definition of ethics that we're working with for this series of class are kind of these moral principles. Um, and the, mo the morality aspect of it really mainly refers to these guiding principles and the ethics are how we act on them, our behavior around those morals. So I think it's helpful just to kind of set those functional definitions of what we're working with. Um, in this case, the ethics are cultivated, as I've been saying, through meditation, through these teachings and through reflection and discussion. Um, what makes it secular? So it's not religious. There's no worldview that's required to participate in, in these practices uh, or these systems of ethics. Um, you don't need to believe in karma or reincarnation. All religious point of views are welcome here and none of them are required. Uh, even Buddhists, you don't need to be, we're in a Dharma center, but this is um, being taught in a secular format. So uh, even if you're not sure about your path with the Dharma, that you're not sure about reincarnation or karma or any of all good, you know, these are, um, a platform of ethics that are based more in logic. Uh, as we talked last week, it's this kind of, we know we have a science that's like when we feel good, we want to do good. When we don't feel good, maybe not so much. Um, so that's kind of a secular aspect of it. And as I've been saying, the embodiment. So really feeling what's coming up in the body, staying with your experience in the somatic field. So these first two classes, we're kind of focusing on the foundational pillars of secular ethics. And these are laid out by uh, His Holiness, the Dalai Lama. I just use the word His Holiness for me that represents a, a sign of respect, rather less about religion. And I also just wanna name, because it's in the news today about what happened with the Dalai Lama and his interaction with the young boy. And it's, um, you know, it's something that it's important for us to talk about. And there are cultural differences of what's sticking out one's tongue. For anyone that's not familiar, the Dalai Lama asked a young boy to stick out his tongue. Um, and in our culture, it was it can be considered to be highly inappropriate. Um, but in Tibetan culture, showing the tongue is something that's more common and respected. Um, I think it's also important to note that the Dalai Lama named the mistake and owned up to it. Um, and so because we are uh, in the Dharma Center and I am referring to the Dalai Lama and his teachings, I think it is important to name that that happened today. And also when we get into our sharing, invite any, any feelings or thoughts that are coming up around that. Um, so we'll have some time for that uh, after our practice. 
Um, but the two pillars of secular ethics are this idea of interdependence and shared humanity. And so our, our time last week, we were really focusing on interdependence. We really focus on a practice of interbeing and how this chain of energy that's moving through the food that we eat and the energy that we consume in the media and the people that we hang out with, that's all in our body. And that we have a choice of what we want to do with that energy. Do we want it to be for the good, knowing the good of others, the good of ourselves, the benevolent um, causes, uh, but really that we have a choice in seeing how we are interconnected um, with everything that's happening around us. This is kind of one of the foundational pillars of secular ethics is this interconnection that we all have. We don't operate in silos uh, that what our thoughts, behaviors, our actions have a direct impact uh, on what comes next. Um, and then, so if you're interested and you weren't here last week and you want to dive into those teachings and practices, that's on YouTube. And then tonight we're going to talk about our shared humanity. Um, so this kind of, um, the shared humanity, uh, this idea that all of us want to move closer to things that feel good and away from things that feel bad. And this, this commonness in our experience isn't just humanity, it's all beings, all animals, even plants. You know, they all want to um, move closer to things that will help them survive. And if they have a nurse, nervous system, feel good and pleasant. We all want to feel that joy that we were naming today. Um, and then this other commonality of our experience is that we want to avoid suffering. We don't want to be in pain. Um, and animals share that also plants share that they move away from things that are that are disrupting their growth or they grow thorns to protect themselves uh, and so this is a not just a, a human quality but all living beings want to experience pleasant supportive constructive things and avoid the suffering and the discomfort and the unpleasantness and so really we can find, you know, in this very divisive, this very separate society that we live in, it's really helpful to find that one common thing, even the people that we disagree with at the most fundamental level, they, we still can identify with that relationship of wanting to feel good and avoid suffering. Um, so all, all of the ethics that we're going to be exploring in this series come from this foundational platform of interdependence and our shared humanity. Uh, so as I've been saying, and I think it's pretty obvious, so, you know, we live in this very polarized, very separate society, um, different races, different ethnic backgrounds, different sexes, different genders, different lived experiences, different belief systems, different religions. Uh, and so sometimes this, these, these problems that we're having in the world are coming from that kind of hyper focus on that, which makes us separate and a, perhaps a perceived threat that something that's different from us um, could bring. And so uh, we, we also are kind of fighting this uphill battle because those of you that have sat with me have heard me say this many times, we're having this sensory experience of separation. My eyes are telling me that you're separate from me. My, my ears are telling me that these objects that are creating sound are separate from me. Um, my sense of touch is telling me that I have a separate and contained body that's different from yours. And these are all relatively, these are all conventionally true. But ultimately that we do have this shared humanity and we do have this sense of interconnection. And so, we also live in this, this capitalist world that, that really thrives on us being separate. It actually accentuates our separateness. And so uh, a topic like what we're exploring tonight is so important to kind of bring that, that shared humanity back into our focus. Um, we can find this kind of common ground and understanding that this is what motivates us and understanding really being the key word here. Uh, understanding. Um, maybe not agreeing with, but understanding why people are the way they are, because they are driven to feel good and avoid suffering. So we started with a reflection and a sharing on something joyful and something sorrowful. 
uh, that we're experiencing. Um, and as we, we heard, there was a sense of connection, resonance, vibration, um, curiosity that was coming up as people were sharing. And I, I want to just read this passage from Jack Cornfield, who um, is a meditation teacher um, called 10,000 Joys and 10,000 Sorrows. Being alive is finding ourselves in the midst of this great and mysterious paradox. There are 10,000 joys and sorrows in every life, and at one time or another, we'll be touched by all of them. We will all experience birth and death, success and loss, love and heartbreak, joy and despair. And in every moment of your life, there are millions of humans just like you all over the world who are being confronted by situations just like yours. Some that are joyful and some that are overwhelming, where they're struggling to somehow learn how to survive them. What matters is the spirit you bring to each day. As George Washington Carver said, how far you go in life depends on your being tender with the young, compassionate with the aged, sympathetic with the striving and tolerant of the weak and the strong, because someday in life you will have been all of these. And I really love this passage because I think it really points to this commonality, especially this last line. Someday in your life, you have been all of these, all experiencing birth and death, success and loss. We all experience love and heartbreak. We all experience joy and despair. And so we can really find that sense of understanding and compassion and relatability and the fact that we are all experience this kind of these shared attributes of the human experience. So what's coming up for y'all as you hear some of this about the, the shared experience of humanity, the 10,000 sorrows, the 10,000 joys, what's resonating or what questions might be coming up? Uh, so one question I have or one thing that I don't, do not understand is that um, this idea of uh, running away from sorrow and getting attracted to pleasure, which also connects to um, always being um, engaged with hope and fear and carrying hope or fear. Um, I think to this state, I don't still understand the uh, Buddhist view on uh, what to do with it, which is in some sense, uh, my understanding is that getting or becoming free of hope and fear is basically the objective. But then also um, we are talking about um, hope and fear as part of a shared human experience and something that even animals uh, experience. And I think um, in this sense, it would be fighting against the nature, which could be true because I think that's actually what I heard from, um, I think Robert Wright, who is a Buddhist teacher, or um, that he wants that in some sense, Buddhism is, is fighting against nature. Um, so there is this conflict that, um, are we considering this to be the nature of our human humanness and are we fighting against it? Or do we want to um, just let it be and, you know, go in that cycle of fear and hope all the time. Yeah, can I ask, what is it for you? Uh, for me, my tendency is to fight against it because um, it's um, it hurts. Um, my therapist view is that um, it's um, the nature, it's we are hardwired this way. Um, and that's the difference in point of view that I have in many other you know aspects too for example we are social beings and we have to have somebody who um confirms us uh, you know like if i'm talking somebody else should be confirming it or nodding or uh, telling me that i exist right um and in a, from psychology point of view it seems like that's how we are what that's what we need and we are hardwired that, that way. So fighting against it is not um, useful. But from a Buddhist point of view, I think, um, in fact, there was this Zen retreat that I was on 
And one of our practices was to talk the other person to listen and have a blank face. Uh, that is why my therapist has called a terrible experiment that was done by a psychologist a while ago with babies and their mothers. So my tendency is to um, fight against it, to be dependent on it. Um, but I don't know what's the right way, at least from a Buddhist point of view. Is, Buddhist, is Buddhism's goal also to fight against it? So thank you very much for sharing all of the insights in your own experience. So just as a reminder, I'm teaching from a secular point of view, not necessarily a Buddhist one. Um, so from with, with that perspective, I, I don't think that in the Dharma that it's saying that we should not feel joy and that we should not feel sorrow. It's about the alleviation of suffering. And so the suffering that comes from attaching or clinging to the sources of joy, and then the suffering that comes from pushing away things that feel bad. Uh, and so that's, uh, you know, an invitation to fully experience things that are pleasant, that we're grateful for, that we're feeling a sense of appreciation for. Where is it in the body? Can we be with it? Can we savor it and enjoy it while it's here, but not cling to it? and not be disappointed when it's gone. Uh, and then the similar flavor for the suffering is instead of resisting and pushing it away and trying to avoid it, can we soften and allow it to be here? And in the, the, the lens of secular ethics, it's actually those commonalities, because even in that, everyone's nodding their head, right? We can all relate to that. So for this class, we're just kind of staying in the realm of the relatability that we all want to feel good and that we all want to avoid suffering. And then the, the Dharma path would really reveal some practices to help us be with that. I personally am not of the school that my interpretation of the Dharma is not that we should not desire or that we shouldn't enjoy things or that we should push anything away. It's that we should just be with it fully and learn from it and experience it. And in fact, it's particularly with the suffering, as we're talking about our shared experience and ethics, if we don't be with our own suffering, then we can never wish for another person or understand another person's suffering and want them to be free from it. So if we never experience suffering, it would be very difficult for us to um, feel compassion for someone else that's suffering if we didn't understand our own. Yeah, that makes sense. I think the key key point here is to uh, not cling to either right. of them. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So I want to just have some time to practice and then uh, this will just be a shorter practice because I want to leave plenty of time for more conversation. Um, so really this idea of experiencing joy and suffering, and we kind of named it already, is that these things are happening together. Uh, it's very rare that we only feel joy and that we only feel suffering. We don't experience our emotions in, in these silos. Um, so in this practice, we're just going to explore a little bit deeper what it's like to be with both of these aspects. Okay, So as always, an invitation to bring some curiosity and an open mind to this practice. Just check it out and see what it's like for you. So this will just be about 10 minutes. Leave us uh, a good 20 minutes of conversation. So making that transition back into a period of formal practice, perhaps closing the eyes or just softening the gaze. And let's invite our awareness down into the body once again and starting to pay attention to your right hand. Just pouring all of your attention into the sensations that you're feeling in your right hand. Perhaps there are sensations of contact of the hand resting on a surface or another body part. Perhaps feeling deeply inside the right hand, sensations of tingling or pulsing.
and then shifting the awareness over to the left hand. And just taking a moment here to explore the sensations on the outside of the left hand, the inside of the left hand. And then what is it like to broaden the awareness to become aware of both the right and the left at the same time? Perhaps you're noticing the awareness moving back and forth between the left hand and the right hand. Perhaps there's times where you can feel both at the same time. There's no right or wrong, just noticing what it's like to pay attention to both hands. And then let's shift our awareness to somewhere in the body where we're feeling a sensation of hardness or pressure maybe an area of the body where we're experiencing some sort of discomfort or pain. And just taking a moment to explore those sensations. Is there a texture or color or temperature that's associated with that sensation? And then letting go of that part of the body and finding a part that feels soft or pleasant. Maybe it's the soft touch of fabric against the skin or a soft belly on the exhale. Just finding a part of the body where there's a pleasant sensation or an experience of softness. Taking another minute just to explore what that experience is like. And from here, an invitation to once again, broaden the awareness to hold both the unpleasant or the hard sensation at the same time as the pleasant or the soft sensation. And again, maybe you're noticing the mind moving back and forth between the two areas of the body. Perhaps there's times where you're resting with an awareness of both sensations simultaneously. Maybe even times where the two sensations cancel each other out. Again, no expectations, just checking this out. What is it like to be with both this hard and the soft, the pleasant and the unpleasant sensations in the body at the same time? And then letting those sensations go. And let's return to our joy and our sorrow that we shared earlier. So perhaps beginning with the area of the body, you were noticing the pleasant sensations that arose from reflecting on a joyful experience. It might be the same as it was earlier, or maybe that shifted to a different experience, but just resting for a moment. And what arises when you recall that joyful experience? And 
have been shifting to an awareness of that unpleasant experience that you had today or that you're having right now. And just resting for a moment in the felt experience of that challenge. Where does it show up in the body? And then what is it like to broaden the awareness and be with both the joy and the sorrow? Maybe this is being with both manifestations of sensation or perhaps being with both aspects in your mind. Perhaps you're noticing the mind moving back and forth between the two, perhaps periods where you can be with both, maybe times where they might cancel each other out or become more neutral. And now letting those sensations go, gathering up all the attention and calling to mind a loved one. Just bringing their essence or their likeness to the mind's eye. And consider something that's going really well for this loved one right now. Notice what arises in your own somatic field as you recall this joyful experience of your loved one. Perhaps there's a sense of empathetic joy, happiness for their happiness. And then also calling to mind an aspect of life that might be difficult for your loved one right now, a way that they might be struggling or facing a particular challenge. And again, notice what's arising in your own body as you call to mind this stress or suffering of your loved one. Perhaps there's a desire to alleviate their suffering or at least wish them ease as they face this challenge. And what is this like to call to mind the joy and the sorrow of your loved one? And now letting the image of your loved one begin to dissolve. And one final stop on this journey, let's call to mind something that's going really well in the world that you're aware of. Perhaps a particular cause that you believe in that's gaining momentum. Perhaps a group of people that are experiencing success or are thriving. being with the felt experience in your own body as you call to mind this joyful thing that's happening out in the world. And then if it feels okay, calling to mind something very difficult that's happening on the world stage right now.
And as you call this challenge to mind, notice what's arising in your felt experience. Perhaps a desire for it to be a different way or for people that are suffering to find ease or relief. And then what is it like to rest your awareness that both this joyful experience is happening out in the world and this difficult one? And before we come to an end of this practice, we've been on a bit of a journey in the mind and the body. So let's just take a moment to ground ourselves, perhaps returning to an awareness of the breath or the support of the ground beneath the body, just to help anchor, ground ourselves for a few moments. And then with an intention to carry forward any insights or realizations from this practice as we begin to now transition back to open eyes if they were closed, returning to an awareness of light and each other. you all for joining me in that practice. I'd love to hear what that might have been like for you. What came up? If you're online, you feel free to unmute yourself and just talk or share in the chat. And here in the room, if you'd like to share, just grab the mic. For me, the practice of um, both was actually kind of fun because I'm a very visual person. So I made it like it was like it was like designing a collage in my mind mm. of putting those things together, especially the last one about things in the world, because the thing that is happening in the world for me that's very joyful is something that happens in water and then the very painful, destructive thing is also something that happens in water. So that was really interesting to see both of those together. Can I ask what, what was it like? What was your felt experience when you were focusing on the joy and the challenge? You know, earlier when, when, when we were focusing on our own sorrow, I think that that, you know, that was really that's something that I was able to experience immediately, but I was not able to have like empathetic sorrow, if that's a word for actually, for, for I think for any of these visualizations that we just did. How are you relating to that? It's so disturbing. <laughs> yeah, it's something to just explore, you know, there's no, as we've been saying, there's no right or wrong. There's no way that you should or should not be feeling. It's just part of the practice. You know, sometimes it might feel a little bit more distant and other times it might feel really heavy on us. So that's okay. Thank you. Any other reflections on that practice? Um, it was very interesting, first of all, and then also, uh, how I felt was also had a good, like a joyful part and a sorrowful part, uh, especially when I was thinking about, um, the person I care for and their pain and their joy. Um, I think it was 
on one side it hurts because I have a tendency to want all the joy. Um, on the other hand, I think um, just getting in touch with the reality uh, that it's just so uh, was very joyful and relieving. Relieving. Mm -hmm. And yeah, also reminded me of um, I recently read about China Masta, which is a deity of contradictions. Um, so very interesting experience. Um, I was noticing that the image when I was thinking about someone I cared for, um, I obviously think about their joys and sorrows a lot, but I don't know. I actually like try to feel it. And so that was a different, cause I was, I don't know. I just, as we, you were asking for reflections, I was like, I know I have one, but I don't know what it is. <laughs> and I was thinking about how just that was a different experience for me to sit with their sorrow and joy, like here. And I think I'm obviously talk to them about it. I know about it, but I don't try to, I think, feel it a lot. And what was that like when you did that? Uh, it made me feel um, more empathy and also joy for them. Yeah. You know, like I was like, oh, that's kind of awesome. That's happening to, to them right now. Like, I, and I was feeling like the joy of myself in a way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. As I, as I listen to you speak, I'm reminded kind of what Tia was sharing earlier, but almost like there was like a resonating or like a tuning yeah. in with their joy and their sorrow. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah, Julie. I was just thinking about that as well when I was thinking about the loved one. I couldn't like... Like everything else is me, like trying to be objectively looking at these sensations coming and going. <laughs> but I thought, think about my son and my heart just, I mean, it just wells up. And then his challenge is that he's going to have a, a child in about six weeks. And um, that's going to be very challenging. But again, this like welling up happens, even though I'm very worried and hope that he does well and, you know, have lots of you know, um, thoughts about that. But it reminded me, I also, he's 42. So 40 years ago, I lost my second child of complex heart malformation. And um, yeah, so uh, during that time, and it was only a few days uh, around Christmas, but during that time, the, um, the pain and the suffering, the empathy, the love, all of that stuff, it actually elevated itself to a um, a dwelling in a grace. And this was the first time that I kind of also felt that there is something particular about the relationship between a parent and a child that may, makes it very easy to be in a space of grace, even about their suffering. You know, um, it's, it's very interesting. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. What would that, what is that like to kind of expand beyond the parent child and kind of what was, you know, maybe either your experience in that practice or just in general of issues in the world? Yeah, right. Like um, I do have a friend who lost her mother when she was in her early twenties. And so she kind of like sees me as a paternal figure in her life. And um, I'm able to to be that that for her and to kind of like dwell in this neutral space and you know just witnessing her life so it doesn't it 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 doesn't mean that I don't like feel happy or sad because she's going through something but more like um this position of of truly embracing and enfolding and holding another being um in that kind of care i think also to kind of somehow triggers a grace or something i think it's interesting yeah so would, would it be safe to say that this kind of idea of like cultivating your the shared humanity for you leads to this arising of grace i think so yeah but it's easier to see in that kind of intimate relationship 
and then yes. but yes, I see it growing into other kinds of relationships and and definitely there's a resonance of like what Tia was saying that there's for me there's a resonance of grace um with all living things that sometimes I can you know zero in it as well so yeah interesting yeah thank you for sharing that and and I um uh the word that you use um it's easier with the loved one it's easier with people that we really care about but it's there right and that's why in these practices it's so important that it's that's why we usually start with the person where it's easy to feel that and then start and you even did this with your hands start expanding it out into into the world and so we're, we're really kind of cultivating this idea of like our own sorrows and joys, the sorrows and joys of our loved ones, people that we know, even people that we don't know, things that are happening at the kind of global scale as a way of tapping into that resonance of our shared humanity. So given, given the kind of premise of this class as embodied ethics and Shared humanity isn't necessarily its own ethic. It's a foundation that most of the secular ethics will arise from. But how do you think that our society could benefit from cultivating a greater sense of this kind of common or shared humanity? A lot of the like social justice work um, I think sometimes it can feel, especially as a white person, like um, tempting to think like I'm here to help other people. And I think when you think about it as from the framework of a shared humanity, you start to think about it um, as a collective and a very personal um, cause. Mm. So it's just something I've been thinking a bit about lately as I think about my own practice. Mm. Um, and then as I think about social justice work. Mm. And can I, if it feels comfortable at answering, you said you're thinking a lot about that. How is that feeling? Uh, it feels kind of um, intuitive. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you for sharing. Any other thoughts on how this kind of cultivating a, a greater awareness of our shared humanity can benefit society? I think it can inspire us to actually take action. Um, it being more empathetic and then based on that, realizing that someone is suffering, someone in the street is suffering and taking some kind of action to try and alleviate that suffering because you can imagine yourself in their position. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. So kind of a greater sense of empathy, which is really what the this this platform of secular ethics is built upon, kind of that awareness of interdependence and then this feeling of compassion and empathy that's required to um, kind of explore and embody these ethics. What kind of what gets in the way of that for y'all? You know, like so we spend some time kind of practicing feeling these joys and sorrows and calling to mind that they exist in us and our loved ones and in the world around us. But like, what, what stops us from actually taking action? I mean, I think there's a lot of things, but uh, you touched on at least part of the answer, I think earlier um, that in our system, we're encouraged or we're, we're kind of uh, separated or atomized. Um, and pitted against each other and sort of encouraged to compete with each other and think of everything as a, a zero sum game. Yeah. Yeah. Competition. Right. So like there, there is a realm of healthy competition, but that's not really what's happening here because it's very destructive. So yeah. Like what does, what's the relationship between shared humanity and competition? How do those fit together? Yeah, a big exhale there. <laughs> I feel like I've been so conditioned to um, be competitive. 
And I think part of what you just even like the practice we just did is like trying to sort of like condition myself or recondition myself a little bit. Um, you know, I was just thinking an interaction I had recently where like, I just reacted quickly. I uh, saw the other person as a threat and maybe they were, maybe they weren't, but my conditioning sort of, it led me to this. And, um, so I think in this, in this situation, I'd be like, how could I react differently or how I am taking action, but I want to take a different action. And I think it's tapping more into like conditioning myself to see other people as part of me as like an as a reflex a little bit more and I don't think it is a reflex mm -hmm. like I can sit here and it feels good but I think like as a reflex it's much harder yeah me too <laughs> <laughs> which is why I love the idea of like some guiding principles because I can be like oh right principle number three <laughs> right yeah yeah I love what you're sharing about the conditioning because, um, you know, I think it has been a big part of my journey as I share kind of like waking up and realizing like, wow, I've been so conditioned. I didn't even see it, you know, for like three decades. I didn't even see that I was not only that it existed, but that I was also actively participating in it. And so that's action, right? That, that looking in and looking at our conditioning, that's part of the action, but that is what um, this exploration of secular ethics is asking of us. I love the ideas, we'll get into it as we start exploring more specifics of the specific ethics, but um, I love this idea of uh, the four immeasurables and kind of loving kindness, compassion, empathetic joy, and equanimity as like reconditioning. Uh, I, I also like to think of them as kind of like conditioner as in shampoo and conditioner because it makes things soft and manageable and it restores depleted, you know, it needs the nutrients of the hair. And so all of those practices, and that's really what this class is about is like, how do we practice embodying this? Um, there is kind of like this, I sometimes feel this urge to like go out and fight and create new systems. I'm, but I'm not an expert in any of that. I'm a meditation teacher and an artist. So I can create beautiful things for people to enjoy and I can create spaces for people to practice. And for me, that's my action that comes from the reconditioning. Um, it's not enough. And I want to do more part of teaching this class is that. So an invitation for us all, you know, we're nearing the end of our time together but to really consider what are some of these ways that you can kind of embody a greater awareness of the shared humanity um, and how they can benefit uh, society and those that are around us. I love um, some things that were coming forward and kind of like the stillness of the practice. We heard grace come forward. We heard intuition come forward. We heard empathy come forward. These were all results. These are things that, that y'all shared after coming out of that practice. Um, so an invitation here to see your practice. Meditation is taking action um, and creating this kind of reconditioning, uh, these conditions uh, of reconditioning. <laughs> Any other final thoughts before we wrap up? Kind of, we've been talking a lot about this foundation of secular ethics with our shared humanity. Any other thoughts or questions before we finish? I'll try and make it brief, but um, on, on the topic of our conditioning, and, and this came up in the very beginning. For me, I was raised with this, no, with this notion that um, suffering is like my suffering is really important. And it's really important that it's mine. And it's almost like a competition of like, who has like the greatest suffering. And so seeing like shared suffering, even though I'm a very empathetic person, there's something about seeing it as sh like shared is very contrary to the way I was raised. And then the other side, you know, when you're saying what gets in the way, kind of the opposite of that question for me is um, finding joyful ways of participating in constructive actions that 
are related to social justice. I've been very fortunate recently to be part of a project where we go in and do this very joyful work that, and we create a joyful environment that ends up like doing really good things that we all want to do and believe in. And, and it's really coming from like a place of love. So that's kind of the other side of that coin for me. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah, so much identification to our own suffering. Like, who are we without our own suffering, right? And there is the idea of shared suffering, but also this, this, this sense that the causes and conditions of what makes me suffer is different than what makes you suffer and makes you suffer and you suffer. But the shared experience is that we suffer, you know, and that I want to be free from suffering. I know what it's like to suffer. I don't know what it's like to be in a woman's body. I don't know what it's like to have a different colored skin. But I do know from, you know, being a, a queer person in the world, I do know what discrimination and hate and bias is. And I don't like it and it doesn't feel good. And I don't want, I want to be free of it. And so then when I see other people that are experiencing something similar, that's where my empathy arises because I know what it's like. I don't know what it's like specifically. I don't have a shared experience of suffering in the same way that you all do. And likewise, you don't with, with the way that I suffer in many ways. But I know what it's like to suffer and I don't want to suffer and I don't want anyone else to suffer. And that for me is kind of like the, the well of where my compassion comes from. Uh, so really appreciate all of your sharing tonight. And um, as I've been mentioning, we, these, these first few classes have really been the foundation of the exploration. Um, so the next three classes, we've kind of extended this to a five part series into May. So the next three classes will really start exploring specific secular ethics um, on this kind of platform of interdependence and shared humanity. So, um, let's just finish our time just with a quick reflection. Um, so perhaps closing the eyes, maybe softening the gaze just for two, three minutes. Taking time to reflect on the energy that's been cultivated together through sharing our joys and our sorrows. Exploring through meditation, the shared experience of joy and sorrow, the arising of empathy, compassion, grace, intuition. What it was like to listen to and consider other people's points of view on these platforms of ethics and how we can plant these seeds in our own selves to blossom into the world for a more just and harmonious world. And I'd like to end our session tonight with Shanti Deva's prayer. So just turning your focus to these words, perhaps how they land on you and the felt experience as you hear them. May all beings everywhere plagued by sufferings of body and mind obtain an ocean of happiness and joy by virtue of my merits. May no living creature suffer, commit evil, or ever fall ill. May no one be afraid or belittled, weighed with a mind weighed down by depression. May the blind see forms and the deaf hear sounds. May those whose bodies are worn with toil be restored on finding repose. May the naked find clothing, the hungry find food. May the thirsty find water and delicious drinks. May the poor find wealth, those weak with sorrow find joy. May the forlorn find hope, constant happiness and prosperity. May there be timely rains and bountiful har harvests. May all medicines be effective and wholesome prayers bear fruit. May all who are sick and ill quickly be freed from their ailments. Whatever diseases there are in the world, may they never occur again. May the frightened cease to be afraid and those bound be freed. May the powerless find power and may people think of benefiting each other. For as long as space remains, for as long as sentient beings remain, until then may I too remain to dispel the miseries of the world.
So together, let's follow the next breath deep into the body. And as we exhale, carrying forward an intention to embody the secular ethics as we move into the next moments of life. Returning back to open eyes if they were closed. Thank you all for joining me tonight. So at the Dharma Collective, we are a Sangharan organization and we thrive on the generosity of others. So all the teachings and practices here are free of charge, um, but this is an embodiment of ethics, an exploration of kind of a gifting economy. Um, if you feel called to express a gift of generosity in return, um, you can make a donation. If you're online, Tia is posting in the chat um, the links. And if you're here in person, there's a cash box and a machine over here to make a donation to help keep the center running and um, the teachers not updated. So um, there's lots of great programming coming up at the Dharma Collective. Please check out the website. Um, Lama Soltram Aliani will be here on, uh, is it Saturday? Sunday, 16th. Uh, with Eve Ekman, who's joining us tonight. Um, so they'll be doing a Feeding Your Demons practice, which is life-changing. So check that out. This Thursday, I'll be teaching a breath work for stress reduction. So there's a little bit of it tonight. If you want to go deeper with that, that'll be Thursday. Um, and then this series will, will continue for the next couple of weeks every Tuesday night. So Thanks, everyone at home. Take care.